you. Thanks, Simon. Okay, I, I probably should have um, called this talk tonight something like, is this for real? Because um, when I first started introducing this subject to people, the reaction was, oh, don't be so stupid, they're not going to do anything like that. And I said, well, you know, believe it or not, that's exactly what they want you to think. And I had one of these conversations, and the next day I was doing some research, and I pulled up a document from the National Health Federation. And you're going to hear about this organization during the course of my talk tonight. And the opening paragraph here, it says, Never heard of Codex? That's exactly what they want. The Codex Agenda. And we'll expand on this through the evening. The Codex Agenda. Only low-potency supplements available that will do nothing for your health. All or most foods genetically modified. And any beneficial supplements unavailable or sold only by prescription. Which is, by the way, exactly the way it is in Norway right now. And certain other countries are further down the road. But the key point here is... Never heard of Codex? That's exactly what they want. So what I'm going to do tonight is basically put you on the spot. Because after tonight, you have to walk away from here and you have to make a decision. And that's a very, it's going to be a very fundamental decision. And when I show you what's coming, I think you'll understand why it's an important decision. But let me start by introducing you to um, this guy here, Mark Plotkin. I first came across this guy, or his books anyway, when I was doing some research in Central America about uh, 10 years ago. And I read a book of his called The Shaman's Apprentice. And Plotkin is a Harvard graduate, and he went on a trip, basically his first trip to the Amazon was just as a gopher. He just, wanted, he just fancied a, a break during his summer vacation, so he managed to finagle his way onto the trip as a, as a sort of bag carrier. But he was so fascinated by that trip that he decided that he actually wanted to change his course of study and actually study ethnobotany. So he went back into the Amazon a couple of years later, but this time on a different mission. And his mission was to go deep into the Amazon jungle and make contact with a tribe that had had almost no contact with, um, with the outside world. This took quite a while to set up, but he did this. And what he discovered there absolutely blew his mind. Because what he discovered was a culture that was really totally unspoilt by the Western world. Basically, the people uh, you know, basically ran around naked. I mean, the only dress was that the men had a little piece of string around their waist. And after a, a few days, he realized that the, this string actually had a purpose. Because when these guys were hunting in the jungle, they used this piece of string to tuck a certain appendage out of the way so they didn't catch when they were jumping over the, uh, the trees and the branches in the, in the forest. But that was it. But what fascinated him was their medicines. And the fact that the shaman, the medicine man, you know, basically was this repository of information that had been handed down generation after generation. And each shaman, as they reached a certain point in their life, would identify an apprentice within the tribe. And it would be the responsibility of the shaman to pass on that information and that knowledge to the apprentice. But Plotkin put the effort in to learn about the work of the shaman. And what he realized was that these guys had medicines, natural medicines, natural potions that they were mixing together, that basically cured their diseases and their illnesses. And they really you know, had a very long life expectancy. So he actually made notes of this and took that information back to um, LA. And to fund his trips to the Amazon, he sold that information that he had picked up to a pharmaceutical company. Well, he went back to the Amazon, he went back up to meet that same tribe four years later. And when he came up to the uh, um, landing stage on the, on the river, first of all, what shocked him was these guys came down to meet him in cut off Levi's and Hawaiian shirts. Gone was the string around the waist. But then what he saw next threw him into a rage because he went into the shaman's hut 
and gone were you know, all the um, vases of the, the local herbs and the, the local plants for making the medicines and they were replaced with rows of bottles from the pharmaceutical companies. And when he looked closely he realised that some of these medicines were the synthetics that had been created from the information that he'd given the pharmaceutical company four year, or sold to the pharmaceutical company four years previously. And he asked the shaman why it was that they were using these medicines and he said, well the missionaries told us that to use our natural medicines is the work of the devil and that we have to use these bottled medicines. Well, I encourage you to read this book. It's still available, The Shaman's Apprentice. He actually goes very easy on the missionaries. I mean, one would expect, based on his experience, for him to be a little harsher. But he tries to go a little easy. The, the book, The Shaman's Apprentice, was actually turned into uh, a film as well, which is uh, also available on uh, DVD. But this is the quote that struck me. Every time a shaman dies, it's as if a library burned down. Well, being a student of um, the uh, traditions, ancient traditions, and the passage of ancient wisdom, of course, the realization this isn't the first time that um, we've, been see we've seen this type of situation. I mean, the same people who were pushing the synthetic medicines on the tribes, you know, have the same belief system as those who burned down the Library of Alexandria in 415, who burned thousands upon thousands of books under the leadership of Bishop Diego de Landa in the 16th century in, um, in uh, Central America. And, and of course, actually, they're doing it right now in Baghdad with the destruction of the Baghdad uh, Museum and the special forces that are going out into uh, ancient Sumer and trying to hunt down any of the ancient texts, just in case there's anything there that contradicts their belief system they wished to put out to the masses. But Plotkin recognized that basically here we have a situation where knowledge that had been handed down for millennia was being wiped out in a heartbeat. The pharmaceutical industry fundamentally is about 80 years old. 80 years old. And then look, on the other side, this is a book that's just been published by um, uh, William Engdahl. It's called Seeds of Destruction, The Hidden Agenda of Genetic Manipulation. And I'm just going to read you a review. It's a review written by a friend of mine in Canada. Because this book is hot off the press, so I haven't read it myself. But uh, his review, he says, this skillfully researched book focuses on how a small socio-political American elite seeks to establish control over the very basics of human survival. The provision of our daily bread. Control the food and you control the people. This is no ordinary book about the perils of GMO. Engdahl takes the reader inside the corridors of power, into the back rooms of the science labs, behind closed doors in the corporate boardrooms. The author cogently reveals a diabolical world of profit-driven political intrigue, government corruption and coercion, where genetic manipulation and the patenting of life forms are used to gain worldwide control over food production. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Gordon Brown has thrown his hat into the arena with this constant reference to the New World Order. A phrase that had never crossed his lips until January the 15th of this year. And he was actually in India when he uh, read a speech, rather haughtingly I think actually. Um, but this was the first time that he mentioned the phrase New World Order. Tony Blair had only mentioned this phrase a couple of times and both of those occasions were in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And Gordon Brown gave a speech at the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, in um, uh, June, sorry, May of this year, six weeks six weeks before he was sworn in as the unelected Prime Minister of this country. And in that speech, he mentions the phrase New World Order no fewer than nine times. And New World Order is very, very significant. Because New World Order, I mean, George Orwell wrote a book, most people know of 1984, very few people know the book that he wrote in 1938 called The New World Order. An extremely prescient book. Arguably even more prescient than 1984. Hitler, of course, used the phrase New World Order. 
Hitler's primary financial backers were the pharmaceutical industry, IG Farben which was effectively the conglomerate of the three major German pharmaceutical companies, which is Herxt, Bayer, and BASF. The CEOs of those companies were charged at Nuremberg and were convicted of war crimes. Most people think of Auschwitz as a concentration camp. What most people don't know is that Auschwitz was the largest work camp ever known. It was seven square, sorry, it was, uh, it was five miles by two, so it was like 10 square miles. It was 10 square miles, that was a work camp. And IG Farben were using these people as slave labor, but also more importantly, more significantly, as tests, as human guinea pigs. And the CEOs were jailed after the war. But within 10 years, within 10 years, two of the senior players in IG Farben were back, in, back at the helm of two of the major German pharmaceutical companies, Herxt and uh, BASF. Shouldn't be any surprise to anybody that the pharmaceutical industry is the most significant financial backer of the Bush regime. So Gordon Brown has made it very clear that you know, he is absolutely signed up to the agenda of the New World Order. And we're going to look at some of the aspects of that agenda. Globalization is definitely a key aspect. And we see this coming down the tracks, and most people really have no concept about what's coming. Because the powers that be, just as they don't want you to know what the detail of Codex is all about, they don't want you to know about the detail of the political agenda, because it's a little sensitive. So, after the Second World War, this is what the map of Europe would have looked like. Well, 27 different nations represented there all responsible for their own, effectively, internal policy, philosophy, lifestyle. But of course, since 1957 and the establishment of the Club of Rome, which was initially an economic cooperation, or economic cooperative organization, but it has grown into a 27-nation superstate. And right now, a governor of a state in the US has more power more autonomy than a prime minister of a European nation. There is more federal law in Europe than there is in the US. And Europe as a federation has been around for well, exactly 51 years, or 50, 50 years, 50 years and six months, isn't it? March 15th, 1957. It's been around for exactly you know, 50 years, and there is more federal legislation than the US, which has been around for, what, 231. But this is only the start of things to come, because whilst the Europe has been coming together as a super state, this has been happening in other areas of the world. We have the League of African Nations, the League of Arab Nations, the Asia Pacific Economic Community, the Southeast Asia Economic Community, and the one that's coming really fast down the track is the North American Union. This is so imminent, it's being brought about by the collapse of the dollar, you know, interestingly enough, if you look at the graphs, and there was one published in the, uh, in the Independent just a few days ago, and it shows the start of the decline of the dollar at the moment that George Bush was appointed to the White House by the democratic process of the Supreme Court ruling five to three in his favor. And that's the start of the decline. And we haven't seen the end of it by any stretch of the imagination. The intention is to create the North American Union. And, and if you think that this is, um, you know, fantasy, it just so happens that once again I picked up the magazine of the National uh, Natural Health Federation, Health Freedom News, and the president, sorry, the chairman of that organisation, who I'll mention later, is a, a Brit by the name of Paul Anthony Taylor, and his lead article in this edition is the North American Union: an amusing joke or a super government in the making. This guy is one of the lead players on the non-government organization that has rights to participate in the codex process. So if anybody knows what he's talking about and what he's experiencing, it should be Paul Anthony Taylor. There's another reason, apart from the economic relationship, which is perhaps even more sinister, that the US desperately wants to create the North American Union, and that is because their military is struggling to recruit, funnily enough. So by opening the borders, I don't think they're going to get too many Canadians signing up for the military, but
but the Mexicans will be streaming across the border. So all of a sudden, this North American Union, which is you know, just the next step on from the North American Free Trade Association, which of course the EU is just the same step beyond the um, European economic community. Once that happens, then they will have a North American army. And what you'll see is that wherever it is that the US wants to uh, pursue its agenda of hegemony, it'll be mainly Mexicans. And I just about mentioned this document in pretty much every one of my talks, and I've been doing this for a number of years, and it's still probably a very underread document. It's called Rebuilding America's Defenses. It's written by an organization called uh, Project for New American Century. This particular document was published in September of 2000. And if you read it, you would think that this is like George Orwell on acid. Because it, it literally talks about you know, the need for the US to dominate the globe and to do it by any means available, um, uh, which fundamentally means militarily. It even has a couple of paragraphs on the use of pharmaceuticals to enhance the performance of the military. Reducing fear, reducing the requirement for food and water, effectively turning you know, the, uh, the military into um, a, a robotic force. So it shouldn't surprise you that the US military is guilty of so many atrocities because they're drugged up to the freaking eyeballs. You know, this is, they're not human. You know, they're not having any rational thought process. It's spelt out here. So you read this document and you think, my God, you know, this is the work of some real sick you know, psychopath. But then you turn to the back page and you see it's not the work of one person, it's actually the work of 27, including the likes of Paul Wolfowitz, Donald Rumsfeld, the current uh, head of the World Bank, Zolik, who replaced Wolfowitz, a guy called Rabbi Dov Zakheim, who was the guy who on September the 10th 2001, announced to the media that the Pentagon could no longer account for $2.3 trillion. Funnily enough, that little comment got lost in the aftermath of the following day. But these guys have spelt their agenda out in words of one syllable in this document. So it shouldn't really be any surprise to what's, uh, what's going on here. And because of their belief system, and I, I discussed the belief systems in the, the DVD that uh, I put together called Fool Me Once. But these guys absolutely believe that the more information they put out for people to see, and then they do nothing about, that gives them a mandate. So when we read information, and what I'm going to show you during the course of the evening is a lot of what I'm talking about is actually out there for people to see. But then when we elect to do nothing about it, they then take that as a mandate to pursue their agenda. And they will push, and right now we see them pushing, 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 until such point as you know, they'll get civil unrest. And then, okay, they might just sort of back off a tad. So what the next step is going to be is the merger of the American Union with the EU, making it the most powerful economic bloc obviously in the world, it will be totally dominant economically, and it will very quickly swallow up all the other trade communities, all under the banner of the United Nations. The symbolism of the United Nations flag is very significant. That grid that's over the top of the world is very significant. This very aggressive looking symbol underneath it. Anybody recognize that symbol? It's the World Bank the World Bank. And a book that I would highly recommend to you, by the way I don't usually bring so much of my research material, but with this particular subject so many people think that this is just fantasy. I, I have to bring some material so that if you want later on you can come and have a look for yourselves. But this is a book called The Confessions of an Economic Hitman by a guy called John Perkins who spent many years working for the World Bank or for subsidiaries of the World Bank. And his job was to go into developing nations and persuade the governments to buy in to massive credit plans, basically to bring that developing nation government into hock. Because just like on the microcosm, you know, once you've got an individual in serious debt, basically you've got them under control. And the same thing with the macrocosm. If you can get a nation into serious debt, then you, know, you basically have them where you want them. And it shouldn't come as any great surprise to you 
that there's, some, there's a very common denominator between all the countries that are classified as the axis of evil. This Bush term. And it's the countries like Cuba, um, North Korea, Iran, recently Russia. Anyone, anybody wondered why Russia has been demonized in the media, basically, for the last six months? Well, all of these countries, oh, and Venezuela, of course, and an increasing number of Latin American countries as Venezuela and Chavez starts to find ways to help these guys out of their debt to the World Bank. These guys, all of these countries that are part of the axis of evil, are free of debt. And Russia paid off its last instalment for all the billions that it borrowed after the collapse of the Soviet bloc back in 1990. So Putin had actually done an amazing job by appointing the seven ugly sisters, the seven oligarchs, to manage the industrial recovery. Of course, some of those oligarchs got a little bit too carried away and just wanted a bit too much power, and that's why you know, Putin has a bit of a problem with one or two of them. But his strategy was absolutely sound, because what he did was he identified the best guys in the country to take their particular industries and bring them you know, back up to full speed, and obviously enable Russia to become self-sufficient. And Russia is in exactly that position right now. The World Bank has a couple of henchmen to carry out its will, and that is the World Trade Organization, which has been around since 1995, and the World Health Organization. Now these two organizations are complete misnomers, because let me assure you that the World Trade Organization has nothing really to do with world trade, and the World Health Organization definitely has nothing to do with health. Basically, any country that is signed up to membership of the World Trade Organization is effectively under the auspices of the UN. So anything that the World Trade Organization deems to be law, the member countries have to abide by it. And I'll give you one example that you won't be aware of. The World Trade Organization have deemed it quite legitimate for the US to export its hormone impregnated beef. And it sees no reason why any nation, certainly any member nation, should reject the importation of um, uh, contaminated beef, i.e. Con con contaminated with the growth hormone. The EU at the moment refuses to import the American beef. So the EU has to pay a fine to the World Trade Organization of 150 million euros a year. Because we don't want their contaminated beef. And that fine will increase as we continue to, as the EU continues to reject it, then the fine increases until they can you know, make the pit squeak and in the end they, what they expect you to do is go, okay, okay, we take it. Now who's going to eat it? Well, but you won't know. Because a big part of codex is to remove the labeling on foods, as we shall see. Now the EU, a lot of people are under the misapprehension or misimpression that the EU is a, a democratic organisation. Let me categorically assure you it's not. First of all, I mean, you know, we could get into the debate about whether you can actually mention the two phrases, democracy and a three-line whip, in the same breath. I mean, a three-line whip is not democracy. And that's exactly what we have here. But the EU is even worse. When you elect your MEP, it basically is about as effective as electing your shop steward if you're a member of the trade union. Just as your shop steward, you're electing to represent you to the management, but the shop steward has absolutely, well not in this country anyway, in Germany and France is slightly different, but the shop steward has no um, role in terms of determining the strategy or the direction of the company. And this is exactly the case with the MEPs. They are a consultative body. Nothing more, nothing less. They are a consultative body. The real power lies with the trade commissioners. And the most powerful trade commissioner, or sorry, the most powerful commissioner of the EU is the trade commissioner, and of course you know who that is. You know, the most honest British politician. Oh. Yeah, I mean, how many times did this guy get bounced out of the cabinet? It was at least twice, and he might, I think he might have got out a third time before he got bounced. But this is the guy with the power to determine what the EU does and doesn't participate in with the World Trade Organization. And needless to say, of course, you know, we're going down, he's taking the EU down that, uh, down that track. 
And the EU doesn't have a president yet, but in the Constitution, you know, it does call for a president, which also will be um, not elected, it will be appointed. And you know who's been promised the presidency? Why do you think he has to convert to Catholicism? There's no way a Protestant can be president of the EU. The EU is a Catholic entity. It's not called the Club of Rome for nothing. So Tony, to become EU president, has to convert to Catholicism. There he is, there he is, just in case you've forgotten what he looked like. And he's out of the country, what is he, out in the Middle East now? You know, um, peace peace minister or whatever the title they call him you know it's like putting King Herod in charge of the kindergarten <laughs> at least there's one good thing about it nobody trusts him and Gordon Brown of course just desperately wanted him out of the country right now I think he probably desperately wanted him back in but at the time he didn't want to be second guessed by Tony so he wanted him as far away as possible. But uh, I, I have this picture which I think is a far better view of Tony and one which I think um, I hope to live to see one day. I mean, there's no question, this guy's a war criminal of the first order. I mean, you know, the whole team of them. Alistair Campbell, I mean, there's another war criminal. You know, Alistair Campbell very definitely has the blood of David Kelly on his hands, one way or another. And uh, Tony, of course, I mean, just lied through the whole of his uh, tenure. So, what we have is the Soviet state of Great Britain. I mean, you may or may not be aware, but um, uh, Jackie Smith, I mean, there's not a statesman in this current government at all. It is remarkable. Um, but Jackie Smith, within one week of being appointed Home Secretary, signed a piece of legislation that gave access to more non-government agencies to the personal um, lives of everybody in this country than the KGB ever had at the height of the Soviet Empire. And by the way, I mean, let me tell you that the loss of the, this, these discs may actually be good news. It may be good news. I know this sounds really perverse, but, you know, the ID cards, the biometric ID cards were coming down the track so fast that the loss of these discs has proven that basically these guys cannot be trusted with basic data. So don't look on this as totally negative. Somebody may be doing us a big favor here. I mean, the media are putting out, you see, this is the thing, the media are telling everybody, the media are saying, you know, we were promised a referendum, but you're not going to give us one. And what the media will do, and you won't hear Brown actually mention this subject, because what the media will do is they will push this and push this and push this. And when there is no reaction from the public, then Brown will just take it as a mandate to sign us into the EU and that will be it, done and dusted. And we may have seen the last elections where it's possible to include in your manifesto any nationalistic policy. Because under the EU constitution, it will be illegal for any political party to campaign or have within its manifesto any nationalistic ambitions. Which of course effectively, you know, overnight makes the Welsh nationalists, the Scottish nationalists, the BNP, some might argue that's not a bad thing, but uh, it will make any party that campaigns on the basis of nationalism effectively illegal. Even the Sun. I mean, it makes a change for the Sun to actually have words on the front cover, but... <laughs> Never have so few decided so much for so many. And earlier, I think it was this week, Trevor Kavanagh, who, I mean, I've been saying for many years that this guy is the most important political commentator in the country. He's Australian, but he is Murdoch's political man writing for the Sun. 13 million people a day read or at least skim on what this guy has to say in terms of uh, political comment. And in this article, which I think I have a copy over here if anybody wants to look at it, in this article he's basically saying, my God, you know, aren't the British people waking up to what's occurring? Now I don't believe that he for one minute wants to stop nor does his boss, Murdoch, want to stop it. What they're doing is they're just testing the water. And they're saying, you know, how far can we push these people? And there's no reaction, of course. The New World Order. What is the objectives of the New World Order? One world government, one world economy, one world religion, theirs. And the population of less than one billion people. 
And you think, well, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. But let me tell you, there are organizations, and they're becoming even more open about this goal to reduce the population. I just want to um, flag up this, because this is very significant. The Club of Rome is, a, is a, um, effectively an inner group within the, uh, well, the Bilderbergers were a spin-off of the Club of Rome. But this is, the people who sit on this think tank are you know, deep within the inner workings. And this particular report is the first ever mention that I can find of global warming. Now read this very carefully, because in searching for a new enemy to unite us, because this was written immediately after the fall of the Soviet Empire, so the Cold War was ostensibly over. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers are caused by human intervention. And then this wonderful payoff line at the bottom, the real enemy then is humanity itself. You know, the whole idea of these guys, their agenda, these guys are very, very cute. They're very smart. Take nothing away from them. They know their game. They're very good at it. They've had many years to practice. So what they do is they come up with stuff like this to keep us chasing our tail. You know, and, and basically keep us sort of focused. I mean, all this green stuff. Oh, by the way, the, the press said that, that I'm a green campaigner. I'm not a green campaigner. I'm a campaigner for truth and political integrity. No, I'm not a green in any way. I'm about choice and honesty. You know, and what these guys are making very clear is that they will come up with an agenda that keeps people locked into this vicious cycle, you know, and we can tax them for it. We can come up with all these green taxes. I mean, this, this stuff about peak oil I mean, the DVD of the talk that I gave here a few weeks ago on peak oil will be available uh, very shortly. But look at the evidence. Look at the backlog of aircraft. Look at what the oil companies are doing. Peak oil, at best, is 50, 100 years away. What I'm talking to you about tonight is two and a half years away and less. This wonderful piece of work, Dr. Eric Pianka, professor of zoology at the University of Texas in Austin, and he made a speech less than two years ago, and he said, um, basically, the top scientist gave a speech to the Texas Academy of Science, in which he advocated the need, listen carefully, to exterminate 90% of the population through the airborne Ebola virus. Dr. Pianka's chilling comments and their enthusiastic reception Again, underscore the elite's agenda to enact horrifying measures of population control. And this guy got a standing ovation. And just in case anybody's in any doubt, this henge is called the Georgia Guidestones. And it manifested mysteriously in, in 1980. And on it, there, there's, I think, 12 objectives, and they're carved out in 12 languages. I'm not going to go through all the objectives, but you might be interested in a couple of them. Because what the top one says, maintain humanity under 500 million. In perpetual balance with nature. Under 500 million. Now at least Pianka said a billion. I mean, these guys are going to 500, I mean that's, the, the US population is 300 million right now. So these guys are talking about whoever manifested these stones mysteriously 27 years ago. It's talking about 500 million people. And then the next one is guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Where did we last hear that? Oh, Mein Kampf. You know, we're talking at the same agenda. The same agenda. The SS was known as the Brotherhood of Death. Skull and Bones is known as the Brotherhood of Death. And so are the Jesuits. On 9-11, Senator Gary Hart made a statement on TV, and in that statement he said, Americans will likely die on American soil, possibly in large numbers. Now when I heard him make that speech, and it took me a couple of months before I actually sort of managed to find uh, the video of it and look at it again, because it was a speech, I was watching it in Belize, so it was early in the morning for me when 9-11 was going down, but I remembered that speech, but I later traced it, he wasn't actually making that speech from any original point of view, he was actually quoting from another report written by another extreme right-wing group like the Project for New American Century, 
and it was the Hart Rudman US Commission on National Security and they actually included this statement in their report. Americans will likely die, possibly in large numbers. Well, you know what? I reckon he was talking about the pharmaceutical industry. Because in the US alone, there are over 106,000 deaths every year, and catch this next bit, from properly prescribed medicines. Taken exactly as directed. From properly prescribed medicines. I mean, I tell you, this has opened up a whole new avenue of research for me. And there's one particular book that I, I, I came across. It's called Corporate Crime in the Pharmaceutical Industry. And when I tried to get my hands on it, you know what I was, I was being told was that the pharmaceutical industry, this book was published in 1984, had basically tried to buy up every copy of this book. Well, I eventually managed to get this copy for the princely sum of 58 quid, would you believe? And it's an old library book. So I am extremely grateful for the guy who didn't, or lady, who didn't return their library book. I mean, they're made out like a bandit because I came along and bought it for 58 quid, questions later. But it's a wonderful book. Corporate crime in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, wonderful in a perverse sort of way because it gives insights. And you can see that these guys know that this kind of death rate is normal. But they're happy to live with it. And look at this. Another 150,000 people will die every year as a result of other medical blunders. Making deaths caused by doctors one of the leading causes, some would say the leading cause of death in the USA. Well, of course, MRSA and the such um, you know, are also catching up with that. In the 10 years, it's estimated that 7.8 million people suffered death from properly prescribed and properly implemented medications. When the pharmaceutical industry does a test, right, it has to prove that there is a percentage of the people who are participating in that test who received some positive benefit from that particular medication. Any idea what the percentage of, uh, that they have to prove is? 35%? We wish. It's 5%. It's 5%. Coincidentally, by the way, that's exactly the percentage of the survival rate of anybody with cancer who undertakes chemo. You've actually got more chance. You've got more chance of survival by picking up a pistol with one bullet in the chamber and spinning the, uh, the chamber. You've got a one in six chance of survival then. But with chemo, it's 5%. The same level as they have to prove the efficacy of the, uh, of the drugs. So Big Pharma believe it or not, actually kills more people than the US military. Now, I know that's a tough one to believe, but they do. The big pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, and in, just to put this in perspective, in 2002, the top 10 pharmaceutical companies earned more in profits than the rest of the 490 companies in the Fortune 500 put together. And the reason I'm using 2002 is because that changed in 2003 with the oil industry deciding to get a piece of the action. But this is the magnitude of the profitability. So automobile accidents, police and civilian firearms. In fact, in 1997, I can tell you because I was living in the US at the time, 1997 was the first year that more people had died through accidental firearm incidents than through automobile accidents in the US. Now, just as a, as a side, you got any idea what kind of numbers we're talking about here? So it was that's very slight, so to say it's the same number. Any idea how many people died from automobile accidents in the US? And this is 1997. Pretty good guess, David. It's 47,000. It was 47,000 from automobile accidents and 47,700 in, in 1997 from firearm related incidents. And of course, terrorism. I mean, any idea how many people, you know, I mean, forget the military campaigns, but that aside, how many people actually die from terrorism? Once you discount 9-11, once you discount the Madrid bombs on 3-11, the London bombs on 7-7, etc. Any idea how many people die from terrorism? None. Big fat zero. And yet we have a war on terror. But, you know, basically, fundamentally, what's killing people is not terror. It's the pharmaceutical industry. 
and they want more of the action. So why don't we know about it? Well, that's really very simple. You know, the dumbing down process is remarkable. It's very, very successful. You know? You know, a couple of weeks ago, about four weeks ago, um, on BBC One, this is, I think it was 8.30 in the evening, on BBC One, there was a program which was the BBC doing a bit of balanced reporting, and it was presenting the case for a DNA database. On Channel 4 was Peter Oborn doing an expose of corruption in the EU. On ITV was Coronation Street. Now, which of those programs, forget it, you know the answer. And people are starting to realise and ask questions, even in semi-mainstream media, about the impact of food. This dumbing down process, coupled with a dire reduction in food quality, is taking its toll. This is the new scientist, you know, the all-American high. Can fast food alter your brain in the same way as tobacco and heroin? Well, I've got to tell you that it's actually nearly 30 years since I, my first experience of realising that food impacts on behaviour. And at the time, I was a, a young training officer uh, with, um, with Schlumberger, and we had an apprentice there who, at the time, he was a punk. I mean, he came in you know, to work every day dressed like a punk, which was not a problem. He was a wonderful character. I mean, I've always worked on the basis that, you know, I want people working in my teams who have, you know, some drive. You know, my basic principle is it is far easier to rein in a bucking bronco than it is to try and kickstart a dead donkey. Well, this guy was a serious bucking bronco. And I didn't want to lose the guy, but, you know, his behavior was unpredictable to say the least. Anyway, we had a company doctor and I went to speak to this company doctor and I sat and listened to him and he went on for I me mean, about 20 minutes saying how he believed that if he could get this guy to change his diet it would change his behavior and I sat there thinking yeah right. <laughs> anyway I had a lot of respect for this particular doctor and I persuaded this young man to come in to see the doctor with his mother and I told him basically this was his last chance. I mean, if, we, if this didn't work out, there was no way the company was going to be able to keep him on the payroll. Anyway, uh, he came in and he agreed to um, abide by the diet plan that this doctor, this is 1979, that this doctor put in front of him. I kid you not, six weeks later, I didn't recognize that young man. And he didn't recognize himself either. And this is totally without any medication. It was totally on the basis of whatever that doctor had recommended as a change of diet. And that was my first experience. I just logged it. You know, it was a, at the time it was no more than that. I just logged it. But I recognized that you know, there was a link. This was from the uh, Daily Mail just a few days ago. EU ethics experts are expected to call for a ban on clone farming amid concern over animal welfare. But look at this piece here. It is so significant. The US Food and Drug Administration is expected to give approval for the sale of clone animal food without labeling in the next few weeks. This is another part of the codex. The Food Labeling Committee is the responsibility of the Canadians, very close obviously to the US. A lot of pressure from the US. And if we know that food that is labelled has an effect on behaviour, what the hell are we going to do when we have no idea what crap we're eating? I mean, this is how the organic farming is being put under threat. Because once the labelling is removed, how is the consumer to determine whether the piece of meat they're buying is cloned, is um, contaminated with, horse, uh, with, with growth hormone? You know, it shouldn't be any surprise to you that Texas is the largest provider of uh, prime beef in the US. And where do the biggest people live? Yeah? That growth hormone doesn't just stop in the beef. I mean, there's the physical evidence. I lived in Texas for four years, four and a half years. I mean, they're monsters. It's like living in a land of giants. Thank God.
God Ritalin wasn't around when my young apprentice uh, had his problems. But this is an extremely pernicious drug. This was in the Daily Mail. Literally, I think this was the beginning of the week. And you know, here we have a situation, again, where the media are telling us what's going on. Look at the headline here, the sub-headline. Thousands of hyperactic children are being given Ritalin, which can stun growth, or even the schizophrenic drugs. Are they victims of greedy drug firms and doctors too quick to diagnose a condition many say doesn't exist? In the US right now, and this is actually quoted in this article, the article's here if anybody wants to take a look at it. In the US, 10% of all school-aged children are um, prescribed Ritalin. 10%. 10%. And it's increasing in the UK. From this article again, perhaps most disturbing is the suggestion that ADHD is nothing more than the invention of pharmaceutical companies who have used clinical trials to create a disease that can be treated with their drugs. Last year, the NHS spent 28 million on Ritalin alone. Now, Ritalin is a stimulant. I mean, basically, it's likened to, to cocaine. I mean, we'd be mortified if any parent gave their kids cocaine. But this is effectively what we're doing. In fact, the doctors actually don't understand how Ritalin works because it's a stimulant, yet it has the opposite effect. It calms them down. And some of you may have seen a Panorama bro uh, broadcast a few weeks ago where they were talking to families that were prescribing Ritalin. And this um, mother of a hyperactive uh, young girl said, you know, well, yeah, it's nice to actually sort of see her calm and sitting at the table, but it's not my daughter. It's not my daughter. We're condemning these kids to a life of prescribed drugs. You know, it, we are, basically, it is becoming a zombie nation. And we're, we're cutting away the possibility of any spiritual connect at any juncture in their life. Which, of course, is by design. And for the adults, then it's Prozac. And I had a, a, a doctor friend of mine, and I asked him you know, why it was that, you know, out of the people that I knew, um, it was always more women that were on Prozac than it was the men. And he said, well, that's very easy. He said, because the guys have to be dead before they go see a doctor. He said, whereas the women are much more comfortable to go see their doctor, and the doctor is just too quick to prescribe Prozac. And, and then now what's happening is a lot of doctors have little more than a database. You know, what's your problem? Oh, stress? Shh. Oh, Prozac. You know, I mean, they're not even making any, any informed decision. It's just key in the information into the database, and they're being paid a quarter of a million a year to provide that information. It's outrageous. Oh, and, and obviously this was for my benefit. You know, the daily super pill for men over 50. Well, apparently, this is the basis, this um, drug is the same basis as this experiment here. Well, this, uh, this was on the front page of the Independent at uh, the beginning of this month, Friday the 2nd of uh, November. And they tried it out in, fortunately, they tried it out in mice before they decided to offer it to the 50-year-old uh, men. And uh, this is on the front page of the Independent. It says, it can run for hours at 20 meters a minute without getting tired. It lives longer, has more sex, eats more without gaining weight. Could the science that created this be applied to humans? Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> They're telling us it's in our face. You know, we are a nation addicted to pills. Not because we want to be addicted, but because the pharmaceutical industry needs us to be addicted. It's critical. Big Pharma has a very, very simple philosophy. From the moment a life form is conceived until that life form deceases, it is a revenue stream. From conception to death. What is interesting in this book, The Corporate Crime, the, the guy, uh, John Braithwaite, uh, actually tries to understand the mentality. Because it actually rocks him that the people he's talking to, the people he's interviewing, all seem like nice family men. Individually. And I'm sure Joseph Mengele was a lovely guy. But collectively, 
collectively, these guys take on a completely different persona. There is not a, an ounce of humanity in their agenda. There's not an ounce of compassion. It is totally about profits. It's a bit like the American military trying to find ways to kill people remotely. You know, if you can remove the face-to-face -face contact, it's a lot easier to get people to do things that they wouldn't do if they can actually look in the, the whites of the eyes of the, uh, the individual. So Codex. Codex is a very, very complex structure. And I mean, this is just sort of an introduction. But Codex consists of 27 different committees looking at a whole bunch of different aspects associated with the entire food chain. And you can, uh, you can look at this yourself. I will give you some websites later on to look at it. But there's two particular committees that really impact on everything else. And that is these two here. And this is the nutrition and foods for special dietary uses which is um, uh, hosted by Germany, and food labelling, hosted by Canada. Now these two committees impact on all of the others put together. And so when I talk about um, Codex, in most cases I'm talking about these two committees. Because it's these two committees that are really setting the trend for where we're going on moving away from the choice of organic food and the way from the choice of uh, natural, complementary and natural health care. This statement, and, and you have to forgive me for using the quote because this guy is a lawyer, so um, you know, he, he has to use a hundred words when you know, probably two would do, but this is I think a pretty good summary of the whole thing. He says, Codex is the political equivalent of the current toxicology manuals because it endorses and promotes for international trade and consumption in the whole wide world everything from pesticides to irradiation, genetically engineered foods and synthetic analogues for drugs and nutrients in preference to biocompatible natural substances. Now what we're talking about here is the process of gradualism. So you know, if somebody says to you, oh, organic food, we're still going to have access to organic food in 2010, they're probably right. They're probably right. But if somebody says, oh, we're still going to have organic food in 2020, right now I would say they're probably wrong. Because this is the process of gradualism, and what the Codex committees do, because they're under phenomenal pressure from the uh, pharmaceutical companies and the likes of Monsanto, they do it through gradualism, so it's little by little, push a little, and then every now and again they'll give a little, so they take your eye off the ball. I mean, as in France recently, you know, in France, they said, okay, you know, and what was announced in the media is the number of acres dedicated to organic farming would increase. And that was what hit the media. What they didn't say was that the number of acres that was going to um, be handed over to GM crops was going to increase at three times the rate. You have to find what's not written. The Codex was actually started in 1962, and I'm quite prepared to believe that the, the people who originally dreamed up the concept were you know, erring on the side of benevolence. It was only after the likes of Monsanto and the likes of the pharmaceutical industry saw the potential for reaping the benefits of Codex that they started to get in on board here. And of course, what we're talking about here is organizations that have basically bottomless pockets. But bear in mind, like I said, in 2002, the profitability of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies exceeded the profitability of the other 490 companies in the Fortune 500. Now, the, these guys have got people, teams of people, working on strategies to maximize the opportunities brought about by the implementation of Codex Alimentarius. I mean, this, I'm going to show you, this is a real David and Goliath situation. And I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't think that David had a chance. I think David's got more than a chance, but there's a lot of groundwork to do to really give, that, give David a chance. Codex serves the economic interests of Big Pharma. And what is really a concern is that the World Trade Organization will implement Codex using Napoleonic law. Now, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's hardly anybody in the room who knows what Napoleonic law is, because it's something that hasn't existed in the UK since 1215. 
Because in the UK, since Magna Carta, we've had common law. And what common law is, is that if something, unless something is specifically banned, it's okay. Right? So unless something is specifically mentioned in a piece of legislation to outlaw it, it's okay. Napoleonic law is completely the opposite. Unless something is specifically mentioned, it's banned. And the way the pharmaceutical companies work and the way the food companies work is what they're trying to do with the codex committees is make the testing process so outrageous and outrageously expensive that the only people that can afford to get things on the approved list will be the Monsantos and the pharmaceutical companies. Nobody else will be able to afford to go through the rigorous tests that you have to go through to get a product onto the approved list. I mean, this is outrageous. It's completely outrageous. They nearly got away with this in the US in 1994. Now, I was actually uh, living in the US at the time, and I didn't appreciate the significance of it, but um, you know, I was aware that sort of, people were hit in the streets big time, and they were always rallying at the Whole Food stores. Well, right across the US, hundreds of thousands, probably millions total, got hit, uh, people hit the streets, and they were protesting against the implementation of Codex Alimentarius. And it was kept out of the international media. In fact, it was kept out of the limited national US media. It was only reported on a local basis. So the people in Texas who were protesting actually didn't realize the people in all the rest in the other cities around the states were also protesting. But people were writing to their senators, and eventually the Senate realized that actually there was such a groundswell of opinion here, they needed to do something about it. So this legislation, the Deshay legislation, which is the Dietary Supplement uh, Health Education Act, was implemented in 1994. And this effectively put a ring fence around the, uh, the health food and complementary health and um, alternative therapy industries in the US. So what did the Codex Commission do? Just go, damn. Okay, let's turn our attention to Europe. So for the last 13 years, they've been, you know, trying to eat away at the protectionism of the individual countries within the European states. They've been working on the basis that none of the European countries talk to each other, which they're right about. The British government has washed its hands of this. So, I mean, you should write to your MP, as I will talk about later. But the British government has completely washed its hands of this. The British government has said, we'll just do whatever we're told to do by the EU. Okay? Which is basically what has to happen anyway. Because the EU issues two things, directives and regulation. And if they issue a regulation, basically that is law. If they issue a directive, what they're saying is, look, okay, it doesn't have to be law right now. We're going to let you go through the charade of making it look like you're making the decision. But you have to actually implement the legislation. All the privatization that's going on, it's not this government making the decision to privatize the industries. It's like the German government's not making the decision to um, privatise uh, the Dutch railway system or the French making the decision. It's EU directive that's coming down the chain. If you don't, uh, there's some brochures at the back here on the EU and uh, I mean, it does actually try and spell it out in, um, in words of one syllable. So the Deshaies legislation is a ring fence around this for the US, but as soon as the EU capitulates, the way the World Trade Organization operates is that if they've got a template in place in the EU, they can then say to every other part of the world, this is what you now have to do. And if you don't do it, we're going to start fining you. Here's a quick summary of Codex goals and objectives, and this is from the National Health Federation. International global harmonization. I love that word. Harmonization. There's nothing good about this process. Abolition of organic farming through the abolition of labeling. Introduction of GM food and livestock. Removal of all ingredient labeling. And restriction of all natural remedies to include all supplements, herbs, vitamins, minerals, homeopathic remedies, flower remedies, etc., etc. You know, I mean, people don't even realise in this country that the gradualism really kicked in two years ago. Because there's still little bottles on the shelves that say supplement and vitamins and everything else. But get a bottle that is pre-2005 and get a current bottle and look at the dosage. Look at the dosage. The dosage has been dramatically reduced. 
The dosages that you can buy today in, uh, in the UK are basically totally ineffectual. And this is the first step towards abolition. So Codex Alimentarius, I mean this is basically the equation. Unlabeled GM processed foods, which of course means low nutrients, low minerals, low vitamin values. All vitamin and mineral supplements to be of low dosage, i.e. ineffectual. And herbs and other natural health remedies to be classified as drugs. The Alliance for Natural Health right now is actually fighting a case on behalf of a lady in France who is being, it's a test case obviously, but she is effectively being charged as a, with equivalent legislation of being a drug dealer because she was growing illegal herbs. Oh, and you know, the connectivity of things. One, one of the things that you know, I learned in, my, in the course of my research is that you know, the, the picture is never one dimensional. Never one dimensional. And here, you know, we have this situation coming down the track again where we're all going to have to switch to these low um, energy light bulbs. Anybody think that's a great idea? Good. Good. Because, you know, this is, I mean, if anybody has the hips inspector come to their house, if you're thinking of selling your house, all they're concerned about is how many low energy light bulbs you've got in your house. But there's a big problem here. There is a very big problem. Each bulb contains five milligrams of mercury. Okay, so the bulbs last a bit longer. But, you know, basically these bulbs are going to be used en masse for the next X number of years. What's the disposal mechanism for them? Throw them in the trash. I mean, you know, we haven't heard anything about the way in which these things are supposed to be disposed of, so they'll just go in the trash and they're going to landfill and multiply the number of homes in this country by the number of bulbs that people are discarding over the course of a year it's going into landfill okay it's not quite as bad as depleted uranium but it ain't far off in the long term we're poisoning the freaking water supply with things that are being sold to us on the basis of oh it'll help fight global warming and that, that construct of the club of rome from 1991 it is going to impact on the quality of food. Even if you did think you were going to be able to uh, fight this. This is the Independent on Sunday from a few weeks ago when it transpired that the British government has been funding the research of GM crops in this country. And stating that um, GM potatoes will be grown in this country in, by 2009. We have some DVDs of a film called The Future of Food which talks about how Monsanto has been sowing the uh, GM seeds in the west of the US, deliberately choosing the west because the trade winds blow east. So contaminating the farms east of the trial farms. This was from um, the director of corporate communications from Monsanto, and he said Monsanto should not have to vouch for the safety of biotech food. Our interest is in selling as much of it as possible. Ensuring its safety is the job of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Well, we've seen how the Food and Drug Administration deal with the sale of uh, cloned meat. And who do you think is paying for the Food and Drug Administration? Who do you think pays for their holidays and, you know... This was from the Monsanto in-house newsletter in October the 6th, 2000. Agricultural biotechnology will find a supporter occupying the White House next year, regardless of which candidate wins the election. I mean, hedge your bets. You know, these guys have so much money that they can afford to buy everybody. There's only one organization that funds more political activity in the US than the pharmaceutical and uh, biotech industry. And they have a Star of David on the flag. Big Pharma, conspiracy facts, conspiracy facts, corporate crime in the pharmaceutical industry, aspartame or aspartame, if whichever you prefer. It was actually Searle, not Cirque, I think. But um, this is the guy I want to talk to you about because there's a link between aspartame and Tamiflu which of course is the lifesaver to the latest outbreak of bird flu. You recognize the guy? No? Okay. 
How about that guy? Donald Rumsfeld. Donald Rumsfeld was the CEO, I think they say it was Searle, not Cirque. He was a CEO of Searle, which is owned by Monsanto. And um, Searle developed aspartame and obviously wanted to get it in the food chain. Well, the FDA resisted because obviously there was research that proved that it was causing brain damage in young rats. But that didn't stop um, the young Donald Rumsfeld. And as soon as Reagan was appointed president, he made sure, because he financed Reagan's campaign, he made sure that Reagan removed the head of the FDA. And a few months later, the new head of the FDA approved the um, uh, use of aspartame in the food chain. So in the US today, there are a number of individual states. Remember I said that state governors have more autonomy than any national leader in, in Europe. In a number of states, Aspartame is banned from drinks that are marketed at under 12s. But of course here, it's pumped into kids. It's sugar free. But it causes brain cancer in young rats. And Tamiflu. Tamiflu. Gilead Pharmaceutical developed Tamiflu. They couldn't do anything with it, so they sold the marketing rights to, to Roche. And it was just you know, lost in the morass of drugs that don't go anywhere. But then Donald Rumsfeld was appointed Secretary of State and all of a sudden bird flu is the new big danger. And of course it, you know, it's still being pumped as the, as the big danger. And I read um, just yesterday that Alan Johnson, the uh, uh, British Health Secretary, has just authorised the purchase of another 14 million doses of Tamiflu. And you know what? Gilead Pharmaceutical's own documentation says that Tamiflu only delays the symptoms for between 24 and 48 hours. It's useless. And Alan Johnson says that he's also purchased a whole bunch of uh, antibiotics to deal with those cases where Tamiflu doesn't um, deal with the symptoms. I mean, this is outrageous. I mean, if something is coming down the line, I can assure you it ain't bird flu. And Tamiflu is, is going to be a complete waste of time. A comment from the Natural Solutions Foundation, an organisation I'll mention later, and they say Codex Alimentarius is the shrewd vehicle for protecting the pharmaceutical industry. The industry has decided upon an unethical course of action by using deception and deceit in the quest to eliminate natural health products completely. Now, there is an organization called the National Association of Health Food Stores, who you would think would be natural allies in the fight against the implementation of Codex. Well, there you'd be wrong. Because the National Association of Health Food Stores have been targeted by the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and they have been shown how much greater their profits will be when they start selling synthetics over natural products. You know, this is really a test for everybody, a test in terms of you know, integrity and ethics. Here's what's going on. The, big, the pharmaceutical companies are losing revenue hand over fist because people are turning to natural health products. You know, and one of the m biggest campaigners for this is a guy called Dr. Rath, and he's uh, produced this pocket-sized book called uh, Roadmap to Health. And Dr. Rath's claim to fame, and he's a hero in South Africa, because this guy realized that the pharmaceutical companies were making money hand over fist out of AIDS. And so he did his own research, and what he discovered was that actually, if you don't give drugs to people who are HIV positive, but you treat them with natural remedies, you, you, know, you get them to uh, change their diet, and you get them to use herbal remedies, they, they don't actually develop AIDS. It's only when you start giving them the ARVs, the anti-retrovirals, anti, uh, that's it, that they turn into um, AIDS victims. He's written this amazing book called End AIDS here. And of course, funnily enough, Dr. Rath is not exactly flavor of the day with the pharmaceutical companies because they've lost a massive revenue stream from uh, South Africa. This was from the Times a few weeks ago. And when you see it, you think, oh, this is, you know, this is great. 
Look at that. You know, alternative therapy is getting a great write-up. 80% of the world's population rely on herbal medicine. 191 million is spent on complementary treatments in Britain every year. 60% of Scottish doctors prescribe homeopathic or herbal remedies, etc., etc. But, actually, that wasn't quite the balanced report that it seems. Because that piece of information was buried in this article with a headline that said, High Street Herbalists can offer no evidence that their remedies work. So which piece of that article do you think registered on the vast majority of the population? And look at this over here. Expert backs prescription by clinicians. This is the biggest threat to the vast majority of complementary health practitioners. Because part of the quest of the pharmaceutical companies is literally to shut out all non-medically qualified practitioners. So if, you're a, if you've qualified as a doctor first and then gone on to alternative therapies, then at least for the time being, with the uh, current plans of Codex, you would still be able to prescribe medicines. And now this is the case in Germany right now. You know, homeopathic medicines are available, but only when prescribed by a clinician. In 2005, the Alliance for Natural Health launched um, a campaign in the European courts to try and prevent Codex being implemented. And the judge was very sympathetic because the judge, who was a, an EU Advocate General, he referred to the arbitrary powers of Codex supporting EU legislation as being about as transparent as a black box. And basically he was saying, and this is April 2005, no way, Codex, you know, take it away, it's not coming into the EU because, you know, we don't know what it's all about. But Codex, or the World Trade Organization, decided that um, they would launch a case in the International Court of Justice in Luxembourg. And that case came to court in July, on July the 12th, 2005. Now there's a film, which I have some copies uh, with me today, it's called We Become Silent. And this is a film that was made, it's a short film, it's about 35 minutes. It was made immediately after that European court ruling, but before the international court ruling. And in that film, what it tries to show is how the US was able to resist the implementation of Codex in 1994, and try and, if you like, get some enthusiasm for people to resist in the EU. But on July the 12th, The International Court of Justice overruled the EU. July 12th ruling of the International Court of Justice in Luxembourg followed the July 4th Rome meeting of Codex when the 85 countries present ratified the restrictive guidelines for dietary supplements. Canada and the USA amongst them. Objections from China and South Africa were ignored. Just as in the original 2001 version, the current guidelines of the EU directive, listen to this, strictly prohibit information about diseases being treatable by nutrients. Strictly prohibit. It is fundamentally illegal for a doctor to advise a patient that their condition may improve if they change their diet. This is outrageous. This is the players. This is Dr. Rolf Grauskus. Gross Klaus, Big Klaus. He's the chairman of the uh, natalie named uh, Codex uh, Committee on Nutrition and Foods for Special Dietary Uses. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? And this is the team that's fighting them. It's the international non-government organization under the guise of the um, National Health Federation. And these are the three players, key players. Scott Tips who's the president of the NHF, and if you go to the website of the NHF, it's thenhf.com, you can find this book. It's called Codex Alimentarius, Global Food Imperialism. It's hot off the press. It's written by, or it's compiled by Scott Tips. And basically, it's a sum, summary of articles by people who have first-hand experience of dealing with the Codex Alimentarius Commission. And when, I mean, you can tell by the title, Global Food Imperialism, that um, Scott does not pull any punches. The other people on his team, the key players, Paul Anthony Taylor, who lives in the northeast of this country. He's the chairman of the National Health Federation. And Dr. Robert Verkirk. Now, this guy is extremely important, Dr. Robert Verkirk. 
because he realised what was uh, occurring back in 2002. He was um, um, a professor at um, uh, Imperial College in London, and he decided to leave academia and take up the fight against Codex Alimentarius. So he is the scientific advisor. He's the chief executive of the Alliance for Natural Health, and he's a scientific advisor to the National Health Federation. So these are the three guys, the only three guys, basically, between our alternative community here and Codex Alimentarius. The National um, Health Federation is funded effectively from within the US. Paul Anthony Taylor is also the external relations director with the Dr. Rath Foundation, so he's financed by the Dr. Rath Foundation. But Dr. Robert Verkirk is basically self-funded. He's totally reliant on donations. And when I first contacted him and told him that I was planning on doing a, you know, a couple of talks on Codex Alimentarius, he said, uh, where are you calling me from, Ian? So I said, well, South Devon. He said, so you're in the UK? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, and you're going to do some talks on Codex? I said, yeah. He said, good luck. Good luck. Then he went on to tell me, he said, you know, when I do talks on Codex in New Zealand or Australia or in the US, I can fill a small stadium. He said, when I do talks in the UK, I'm lucky if I get half a dozen people show up. Well, when we gave this talk in Tonnes a few weeks ago, I think we had like 30 people. And I don't know what we got tonight, maybe 60 or 70 or whatever. But you know, even despite the efforts that we've made in publicizing, and we haven't pulled the punches this time, we've been pretty much direct in what Codex Alimentarius is all about, and yet we still get people saying, oh, that's not going to happen. The Alliance for Natural Health, I have no connection with them, by the way. You know, I have no tie with them other than I've had a, a number of phone calls with uh, Robert Verkirk. I've met him a couple of times, a lovely guy. I mean, he, but he, he talks out, you know, on, he's a scientist. And I'm sitting listening to him and I'm thinking, you know, in a minute, Robert, you're going to say something I understand. <laughs> ah, there it is. Got it. Thank you. I mean, he's an amazing guy. His heart, he's, I mean, this guy is so genuine. He's so committed. And he's so under-supported and undervalued. And, and then when I met him, I was just even more determined. I spoke to Simon. I said, you know, if we can't get Totnes to recognize what's coming down the line here, then, you know, what help, what hope is there, really, for the organic and complementary and alternative health community in the UK? If we can't get Totnes and Glastonbury to realize what's coming down the track, then, you know, with all due respect, what comes will be self-inflicted. And it really pains me to say that. Because it's unforgivable that, you know, with this amount of warning, if you like, that there's no attempt to resist it. Now, what there is, is at the back there are a number of these forms here which are standing order forms with direct payment to the Alliance for Natural Health. And if you're a therapist in the uh, complementary and alternative health arena, or if you're in any way involved in natural health food stores, or in organic farming, then I would implore you, excuse me, I would implore you to take one of these forms and give some consideration to supporting Dr. Robert Verkirk in his work. I mean, there, it's all very well to have an internal strategy, which is what Transition Town is all about later. But it's important to focus externally. To, and if you're an organization, it's, it's fundamentally essential that you develop a strategy of how you're going to participate in resisting Codex. Because I promise you, this is as real as anything. And if you remember, when I opened the talk, that newsletter from the um, National Health Federation said, you haven't heard of Codex, that's exactly what they want you to believe. Now, you are going to come across in your research some other players, not least this lady, Dr. Rima Labo, whose um, claim to fame is that she had an article which was published in this book, One Nation Under Siege. But she has a, an interesting partner, this guy here, called um, Major General Albert Stubblebein. But he's a PSYOP specialist. Now, these guys have formed an organization which appeared on the scene a couple of years ago called the National Solutions Foundation. Now, I'm making this statement, it's being recorded, but these guys are an unknown quantity. 
They have just made a bloody nuisance of themselves at the Codex meeting in Germany last week. And it looks as though these guys are in some way, shape or form the face of controlled opposition. And they are trying to undermine the work of Dr. Robert Verkirk, Paul Anthony Taylor and Scott Tipps. And if that's not the case, if that's not the case, then their behaviour needs to demonstrate which side they're batting for sooner rather than later. So, I showed this slide last time we gave this talk, the Totnes bubble. It clearly isn't burst. You know, we've gone from 30 to, well, I don't know, maybe 100 or whatever. But it's, the bubble is not burst. You know, the whole landscape of Totnes will fundamentally change if the guys of the Codex Alimentarius Commission are uncontested. I mean, it really is as cut and dried as that. There is no conspiracy here. That's why I bring along this information. And I mean, I bought some information from the Alliance for Natural Health. Please take it. Please take a look at the Alliance for Natural Health website, anhcampaign.org. Please look at the National Health Federation website, thenhf.com. Look at the Dr. Rass Foundation website. You know, go do your own research. You know, this is something that this community should be more aware of than anywhere else in the UK. Otherwise, in 10 years, well, you know, hey, life goes on, I guess. But, you know, it'll be very different from what it is right now. So in the first instance, I mean, I would be mortified if anybody just takes what I've said tonight and requotes me. That's not the point of my presentation. My presentation, I mean, this is not even my specialist area of study. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a practitioner. I'm not directly involved in alternative or complementary health. I'm not directly involved in organic farming, but I choose to live in this community for a reason. And you know what, right now I'm really pissed off. Because, you know, there's a number of us trying to get this community to realize what's occurring and they don't want to know. And I have a big decision to make too, and that decision is do I continue on this particular line of, um, of study and presentation? Or do I just say, hey, you know, it's not cheap to organize these kind of events. It's not cheap to organize the publicity. But, you know, hey, at the end of the day, there's also bigger fish to fry, perhaps. But you have to decide. I said right at the start, you have to walk out of here today and make a decision. And that decision is, you know, maybe you go away and research and you say, yeah, Codex looks a pretty good deal to me. Fine, in which case do nothing because you're in good shape. Alternatively, you may decide to just simply abdicate and say, well, okay, you know, I'll see what happens and let others uh, take up the battle. And that's okay. Or you may say, look, I can't get involved directly. I have other things. I have too many other priorities just trying to keep uh, food on the table or whatever. But then I implore you, consider, consider what you can contribute to the likes of Dr. Robert Verkirk in his campaign. The only way of defeating Codex is through science. These guys aren't going to listen to, you know, complementary therapists getting up there and saying, well, we just don't like this. No, we don't think that's a good idea. We, we need to be able to issue these remedies to, to our clients. I mean, they're just going to say, yeah, okay, thank you. Adios. It's science. It's only science that is going to convince these guys to slow down. I mean, right now, that's probably the best we can hope for, is that we can slow it down until maybe sense prevails. Educate your colleagues and also find out, if you're part of a, an organization, you know, find out what your representative body's attitude is towards Codex. And if they don't have a strategy, ask them why not. Ask them why, you know, what is their, are they happy that Codex is coming down the line? Are they joining the likes of the Alliance for um, Health Food Stores? And, I, you know, I can't say it enough. This guy, every time, I mean, I, uh, it was many weeks of my research, and every time I kept coming back to this guy. I kept coming back to the reports that he'd written. I kept coming back to the in, in, interventions that he made in the Codex meetings. I mean, this guy does have their respect. They don't take on board everything he says, but he does have their respect. Now, if you don't believe me, come and hear Robert for Kirk. Because with Simon and Breathing Space, 
we've put together an event in Totnes at the end of April called the Alternative View. We have Philip Day opening the event on the Friday evening and on the Saturday morning Dr. Robert Verkirk will be here to talk about the Civic Hall in fact, to talk about his experience on Codex. There's some other interesting speakers um, along there. Peter Taylor, who is a scientist, who has done a lot of work with the International um, um, Committee on Climate Change. He has a rather different view on climate change than that which is the orthodox view. Peter Taylor is well worth listening to. We also have um, David Halpin, who uh, is here this evening. And, and David will also be talking at that event. It's going to be an incredible event. And if we can't get people to come and understand about Codex with the likes of Verkirk coming on board, then again. You know, this is the challenge that we face now. You know, this is the decision that you will have really to go away with. You know, we really do have an opportunity to make a difference. So, tonight, I've taken you through a journey. It's been a bit of a convoluted journey. We've hopped around a bit because I wanted to sow a number of different seeds. You won't remember everything I've discussed tonight, but hopefully there will be some part which reached you. Some part which, you know, will sow some key words in your mind and you'll go to your computer and you'll go do a few Google searches and um, you can take a look and, you know, find this out for yourself because it's only when you take it on board then only then really will you make the decision as to which way you go forward and we're going to take a short break for about uh, 15 minutes now uh, after this closing statement um, and then we're going to get back together and um, there'll be an opportunity for some questions and answers and I'd also like to, uh, to hear some of your views on, on the subject but I just want to close with a couple of quotes from one of my favourite philosophers Marcus Aurelius from um, the uh, second century and he said frequently consider the connectivity of all things you know what I'm talking about with codex is not one dimensional by any stretch of the imagination it's linked to so much else that is going on that's why it was so important to include you know tonight a discussion on the new world order and the way in which the UN and the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization you know work with the EU and the way in which they're effectively riding, riding roughshod over national governments. So frequently consider the connectivity of all things. And then finally... Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time.